again. So we are live, so we can go ahead. Okay, so um, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, and um, today uh, we have the privilege of having uh, Professor Taneja from Indore uh, talking to us about uh, ward rounds. Uh, those of you who are aware, the ward rounds is a, a very important part of the DMB examinations and uh, candidates are uh, can secure a fair number of marks in this if they do it uh, well. And I think uh, uh, we can't have a better person than Dr. Taneja telling us about it because he's had years of experience in teaching as well as an examiner. So over to Dr. Taneja. Uh, Thank you. So you can share your screen now, sir. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, my uh, dear students who have been listening to our this program, let me first thing I tell you that Orthopedic Research and Education Foundation in India was uh, established in 1983 by Doyen of Orthopedic Professor B. Mukhopadhyay. The whole idea was to update the orthopedic surgeon who have passed their MS, have gone to the periphery and had no access to the internet, no access to the library, and they wanted to update themselves. That was the idea. And then later on, from 1997, we realized that we have a duty towards the, our postgraduate students also, because especially the DNB students who have been taken admission in different hospitals. The training has been very, very uh, defective and training has been very incomplete. And I had been an examiner of national board since 1986, I think. And we found the results used to be very poor. And therefore we started doing some postgraduate courses and realized that these postgraduate courses are very, very helpful. Now, uh, after having taken so many examinations, we found that one of the weakest part amongst the students was at the ward round. And as you know that the ward round carries 40 marks. And you have the, you can always secure up to 30, 35 marks. And if you secure well in the ward round, then you can have a very bright chances of clearing it. For example, if you have not done very well, in one or two short cases, or you are not done very well on a table viva. Now here is a thing where you can really secure very good mark. So the uh, ward round, why people don't do very well, because it, this is very, very basic thing. And we try to ignore these things. And the examiner wants to know in the last three years, how much work you have done it yourself, or you have given it to uh, the sisters and the ward boys to do your work. So there are so many things in the ward that you see every day. So it will be very difficult to tell you the answer of everything. So what I am going to do you to take you to the round of the ward and I'll show you what are usually there and what are the usual type of the question which are asked. And you can keep on noting those questions. And this is what I'll tell you, you what the examiners ask. So we'll start with our first round next. Now, the most common thing that you, when you go to the ward, you see this uh, uh, thomas plane and you find a patient who is lying in a bed, limb is in the thomas plane, and there has been a traction has been applied. So the whole, the viva starts from this thing. What will be the uh, usual thing? The examiner will ask you about the thomas plane, who was the human thomas, what is the size of the thomas plane, how, what is the construction of the thomas plane, how the thomas splint is prepared, where the paddings are put, and all these things will be asked about this. So you should be prepared, and there's no such answer that sir, I do not know any this thing about the thomas splint, because you have to know everything about the thomas splint, right. The second thing is, there, there will be what you see is a traction. Now there's so many things, because every day what is happening in the ward, what we see, 
the hardly the DNB students applying the traction themselves. It is the sisters or the ward boys who are applying the traction. Now this is a skin traction which has been applied. So you should know what are the indication of the skin traction, what are the contraindication of a skin traction, how a skin traction is applied, and this is what is very important. And then once you know that the tractions are of two types, the skin traction and the skeletal traction, about which we'll talk to you later. And then the question will come, the examiner will ask you, what are the basic two types of traction? So you have to say that it is a, either a fixed traction or it is a balanced traction or a sliding traction. Very common question which is asked from the student is, okay, what is a fixed traction? And surprisingly, the students try to baffle on these things and they're not able to answer what is a fixed traction. A very simple thing is that if you are pulling against a fixed point, like for example, you've got a hook in the wall and you put a wall and you're pulling it against the fixed wall, this is a fixed traction. And the balance traction, very simple thing, like you take, have a tug of war and two people are pulling it on either side, that becomes a balance traction. So like you do this. So these are the, some very... Uh, is small things, but uh, to show a blank face to the examiner is not very acceptable. So remember this thing, that you should know everything about the thomas plane, know everything about the hue on thomas, know everything about the traction, the skin traction, the skeletal traction, the fixed traction, the balance traction. Now, uh, uh, this is the, you, you are going to the ward. And please remember that examinations are usually held not in the private hospital. It is usually held in the government general hospital where you find all type of this. In this particular patient, uh, the traction has been given by the, the brick. Now you can see that the limb is in the abduction and the limb has been put into flexion. So the examiner will ask you the, why this position. So you should be able to say that this child might be having a fracture in the proximal one third of a femur whereby the pull of the ileus wall, the fragments, the proximal fragment get flexed and abducted. Therefore, uh, this section has been uh, given this way. Now, this is a, uh, sometimes this is, of course, a photograph taken from a book, but it is, again, a, quite a common thing, and the Dunlop traction, which is uh, basically given in the patient who have a supraconductive fracture with a postural lateral displacement, and in which it by when you have reduced the fracture and you are trying to flex the elbow, which should be go beyond 90 degrees, you find that the peripheral pulsation is getting geopardized. Therefore, you cannot flex the elbow, and therefore you have this 45 degrees abduction at the shoulder, and then you keep the elbow at about 45 degrees, and thereby you will be able to see that your fracture, which has been reduced, will remain in this position and your circulation will also not be geopardized. Now, in the children, um, uh, this is also quite a common scene, what we call as the gallows traction, or it is also called as the branch traction. And you, what is important thing is that uh, uh, this uh, is usually not given beyond the age of two years or three years. And after the skin traction has been applied, the skin traction should be such that the the buttocks get little raised up from the bed so that the weight of the body will be putting, putting it down and your traction will be pulling it upwards. A very good method to treat the fractured shaft of the femur in children, and this is also called as the branch traction. Now we come to the uh, very commonly th things which is uh, commonly asked in the examination is the skeletal traction. Skeletal traction means when you are applying traction, through the bone, because the how a skin traction, the traction is applied and goes to the bone is a different way. Here you have passed the um, stimulant pain or denim pain through the bone, and you are applying a traction through this thing, and they are called the skeletal traction. Very common questions are asked from which uh, at at what uh, places you can apply a skeletal traction, well, you can do it in the skull, you can do it in olecranon, in the metacarpals, you can do it in the trochanteric area, lower femur, upper tibia, lower tibia, calcaneum, so many places where you can apply this. Now, <clears throat> this is a, a quite a common question in the DNP 
then uh, because it's very commonly seen in the ward and they they ask you how you pass a statement pin and have you passed it yourself so you should be very clear that uh, what is the size of a statement pin which are usually about 4 to 6 mm you do it under local you do it from lateral to the medial side Uh, protecting the your little popliteal nerve you have to go it very slowly you don't have to hammer it now these all things are very carefully you must be very very clear how a statement pin is passed now this is what you are seeing is in a bowler stirrer and the statement pin has been incorporated into a below knee plaster and this is called as a charnle traction unit because the charnle said that when you do so you have many advantages number one the the traction pull is shared by the bone as well as by the plaster one you can prevent the any infection which will be prevented by putting this thing and the third thing is that you can prevent any equinus deformity so there are certain uh, advantages and that is you must be able to uh, answer this thing now this is uh, which is showing you that how a bowler stirrup is used and this is showing you the denim pin which has got the serration in the center which we used mainly for the very osteoporotic bone and this is the one which you are seeing the lower down is basically a kirschner wire strainer kirschner was in a german fellow and he devised this wire which is one of the it is said is one of the most popular implant all over the world and it Well, must not have seen the Krishna wire uh, stirrup. Therefore, I brought this thing from a book, and you can have an idea that this is a Krishna wire stirrup, which is used for giving a traction. Now, this is from the lower uh, femoral traction. Then this is at the lower tibial traction, and this is uh, the examiners are fond of asking the level at which you will pass the. a uh, pin so you can see the lower femoral thing is the upper limit uh, the is at the upper pole of the patella and you draw a line from the head of the fibula upward and where it crosses that the place where you are putting it so you are in a safe zone same way in the uh, upper tibia and some way in the calcaneum also where you have to be posteriorly and downward from the lateral medullus about 3/4 uh, of an, uh, an inch now the, the any time you are passing any pin whether it is a shank pin or your denim pin or your uh, statement pin you have to be absolutely in a safe zone so that you don't cause any damage to the vessel or nerve that is the important thing of doing this thing infection can be given in many way using and uh, this is a using a canvas and patient is tied to what the this patient had an articular surgery and he has an head halt retraction of canvas has been applied to him but if you want to give a more uh, traction as you have to give it in a cervical spine injury then of course they you have to apply a, a, a skull traction now for the skull traction the very common thing is at what level you have to pass the pin what precaution you have to take it and everybody you know that that you have a two line one going through the mesoid to mesoid and one going through the center of the head and at the most prominent part in the parotid you have the point where you put in a local anesthesia and you can put this thing there are many different types of tongs which are uh, available but what is most important is that uh, the drill that you use they are usually the guided drill so that you don't pierce more than 3 mm to 4 mm and you don't pierce the inner table of this thing this is another traction which is the garden bell strong and there are some other designs also the most important thing is the examiners are fond of asking is that how much uh, uh, weight should be applied and you should be able to tell the lower the injury for example if you have a c1 you can start with about 5 pounds but if you are going down up to c7 then it will be a much higher and it could be a around um, um say 7 to 8 kg you can go down now if a person has got a some fracture dislocation or dislocation of the spine 
sometimes you have to give much more weight but that weight doesn't remain for very long time maybe an hour or so and you have to take an x-ray every 50 minutes lateral x-ray to make sure that your the reduction has been achieved and that reduction is then maintained by five to seven pounds of weight that is very important and so these are the questions that will be asked to you in the examination and they because they expect you and they'll say they have you ever passed and in crash field or this kind of traction now this is a uh, again a very common thing in the world which is called as a bowler brown splint and a lot of controversies on this thing i just want to tell you that the originally this is splint which had only one pulley was designed by brown brown was an american fellow and um, his full name was hendrik brown and he is also considered to be as a father of local anesthesia uh, as far as i know that uh, he was uh, basically an orthopedic surgeon maybe he might have specialized in the anesthesia and bowler was a father of traumatology of the europe in vienna and when uh, brown saw this uh, his splint he added uh, two more pulleys and that is how uh, this bowler brown splint came so it should have been a brown bowler splint but originally brown but the brown gave it a name giving respect to the bowler and it used to call it as a bowler brown splint now this uh, you can see that uh, there is a angle at the level of uh, knee joint but this is a very important thing that just under the popliteal region this angle should not be there it should be more proximal because you see it is a a good splint where you want to treat the supracondylar fracture of the lower end of the femur so that the the uh, distal fragment doesn't go into a flexion and that is how you are supporting this thing and in this you can uh, they ask you the different pulleys how they work and how this applying the traction and uh, so you should be able to tell everything about the bowler brown splint this is a sometimes the uh, those centers who are doing lot of scoliosis work these are the hello tractions and hello body arthrosis very rarely you see in the ward but you should have an idea this is in a hello pelvic and usually given in patient of the scoliosis surgeon hello pelvic means that the pins from the pelvis and then it go into the skull and there are pins in the skull and which is in an auto lock system just to get an idea that sometimes there may be this thing. this is a quite a common thing usually find in the casualty of each hospital kremer wire splint which is mainly used for the uh, temporary immobilization of a, any injured limb you can just do a padding over it little gemji it can burn it can bend in any way you like it and you are supposed to answer this what this is splint is now this is about the so first thing this very important thing you learned the few important splints and the uh, traction and i'll tell you that from where you can read these things in more in detail the other thing which is a very important thing is a plaster of paris uh, because this is our bread and butter but uh, unfortunately the dnb student are very very poor these days in plaster of paris technique um, but the examiners who are your examiners they are all a very senior and elderly person who have used plaster all their life and they are very fond of asking the uh, techniques on the plaster so you have to know a to z about the whole plaster they say they ask you why it is called as plaster of paris so you should know about the history of the plaster of paris and uh, what is the chemical formula and uh, how the uh, the recent oxygen is produced and the how this plaster of paris is this now usually they they are usually most commonly they are 4 to 6 inches bandages and their length is i think about 2.7 uh, meters all plasters are padded plaster we these days don't give any unpadded plaster which at one time it was a bowler has popularized this thing but we don't use this thing and these days of course we have got a fiber glass synthetic bandages which are available in different colors but these bandages uh, um, are light they are strong they are waterproof but uh, remember that the two big, big disadvantage with this uh, the fiberglass synthetic bandages are one that you cannot do a molding 
I have seen people applying this bandage for the ponsetti casting, which is absolutely wrong. And the other thing, important thing is the removal of this bandage is, is extremely difficult. We just cannot cut it at one side and remove these bandages. It has to be cut by bivalving it, cutting it on both the sides, and you should have a proper uh, plaster cutting saw for this thing. Now, this is a when you do not pull and case the whole limb, then it is called as a slab. The slab should be covering the at least uh, a three fourth of the limb, and uh, this is given especially uh, in early stages when there is a lot of swelling, and that is usually uh, six to eight layers are good often in upper limb, but ten to twelve layers are important in the lower limb. Now, this is a when you have a complete plaster, then it is called as a POP cast. So you should be able to tell them. This is a U slab and uh, usually given for the patient who have got a fracture shaft of the humor. And uh, this is called uh, the hanging cast. Now hanging cast was popularized by the Caldwell in 19, 1949. And this is very good for the uh, patient who have got a fracture of the lower one third of the humerus uh, because it is the weight of the plaster which keeps the fracture well aligned. Now, this is a spica plaster given for the patient of the congenital dislocation of the hip. You can see there is an abduction, flexion, and external rotation, and absolutely into a safe zone. So the, here, they, uh, I have seen that if you ask the NV student, what is the definition of spica, and they give you a blank face. It's simply, it is a... a appendiceal part, a limb, when it is incorporated with the trunk, then it becomes a spica. You should be able to uh, answer this simple question and there's nothing this thing. This is a typical uh, ponsetti plaster. So there can be a viva if the child is lying there. There can be a viva on the ponsetti plaster technique. This is a elbow cast bracing that uh, then there can be a viva what is a cast bracing by on Sarmiento and on the philosophy of the functional cast bracing. All the, this other example of a knee cast bracing that has been shown. And this is a petal tendon bearing cast which uh, was popularized by the Augusto Sarmiento, I think in 1968. And this, he took the idea from a PTB prosthesis and uh, how it is applied, what is the principle, so you should be able to uh, answer these questions. Now, this is a olecrano condylar brace. For example, the patient has got a fracture of the lower end of the ulna. Very well treated by the, this thing. The elbow is free. The wrist is free. And this is called uh, the olecrano condylar plaster functional brace. You, these days, you don't see much for the patient who are having a uh, cervical spine injuries or cervical spine tuberculosis. We, our younger age, we have all applied this Minerva plaster jackets. And uh, uh, the few things that you might have not even have heard or seen that if you are treating a patient who conservatively a fracture, say, tibia fibula, and you do get an check x ray and there is an angulation which you do not want to accept it. So we used to correct it by doing a veggie. It can be a closed wedging or an uh, open wedging. We used to, you can see lower down, we used to apply this, uh, the plaster heels on which the patient used to walk. And sometimes this type of uh, uh, device in which we used to incorporate uh, into the plaster and a patient used to walk even without taking a weight. So normally you don't see these things, but uh, uh, sometimes the, the very elderly and senior examiners expect you to answer this thing. This is, of course, you must not have ever heard of. This is the Agni Hunt plaster. The Agni Hunt was a nurse in Oswestry in England. And she devised this uh, method of correcting the fixed flexion deformity of the hip joint. And uh, this is a Thomas test which has been done. When you do a Thomas test, then what happens, there's an obliteration of the lumbar lordosis and the limb goes into a flexion, uh, whatever the flexion deformity is. So uh, she puts this uh, unilateral hippie spica, which is supported by a sling, 
and the limb is put into a thomas frame say in about 30 or 40 degree reflection deformity the and then gradually the thomas print is brought down and the uh, flexion deformity gets corrected. So this is an agnihan uh, plaster. Now, uh, you see the use of plaster in orthopedics are innumerable. You have, we used to make plaster bed for tuberculosis of spine, Minerva jacket, the spica, CDH plaster, Ponsetti plaster. What is a Paul Brown plaster? Paul Brown plaster is basically a long leg plaster with knee in full uh, extension so the patient could stand and take walk. Anderson plaster where the the pin so that there is no collapse. So you pass a pin uh, above the fracture and pass a pin below the fracture and incorporate into a plaster that is a Anderson plaster, PTB plaster, FC plaster, Charnley plaster, use the hanging cast, plaster jacket, functional POP functional sleeve, all eternal condylar base. Agni hand plaster and plaster boot and well leg plaster. These are so many uses of a plaster in orthopedics and uh, all senior people have used them uh, um, in quite a few number of the cases. So you should know that where all you can use this thing. And then the other important thing that you see in the ward is a uh, external fixators. <clears throat> now the uh, external fixators, um, uh, they want to know who was the man who popularized this thing. It was an American, uh, Dr. Hoffman, who got the idea from the veterinary, this thing, that uh, uh, they were using it for their horses and other animals who will break this vector. So he brought that idea. And now these are extremely good method of uh, stabilizing a vector, especially the compound fractures. They are not the definitive treatment but they are basically to stabilize the fracture, the open fractures where you do not want to do any internal fixation and this thing. Now, there are many uh, types of uh, AO fixators and the ring fixators. There are so many types of fixators that uh, you know that the LRS and uh, uh, Joshi stabilization system. Now, the most common the fracture the examiner would like to ask you that, uh, okay, how do you pass the shans pain? What are the safe zone? How do you increase the stability of your uh, uh, fixator system? Then you have to see, sir, it all depends on the the size of the shans pain that we use. We use how many rods we are using it. And uh, uh, what is the distance of the span? What is the distance of the uh, two rods? So there are lots of things by which you can uh, preloading this thing and you can uh, increase the stability of this fracture and you have to you know that that whatever this thing it is not a definitive method of treating a fracture and you have to uh, then preferably by six weeks you should be able to remove this external fixator and you should go for any um, definitive treatment for this thing so there are many uh, methods of uh, and many types of fixator that you all have been using it and they will ask you that is the pin has been placed at the right position or not and uh, the, uh, what are the advantages, what are the disadvantages and the most important uh, complication of external fixator is a pin track infection, the loosening, breaking of the, uh, breaking of the pin. So these are some of the, these things you can, while passing this pin you can cause a neurovascular damage also. So this is another type of uh, external fixators that you are seeing that they're putting the two rods through this thing and to increase the stability, you can add one more rod and they are different types of a hybrid type of the uh, this thing where you can, along with that, you can use the um, uh, ring fixator also. So all modification like this thing in a ring fixator is down. This is a hybrid type of external fixator. Then this is a uh, another uh, where you can have the different tracks of rod in different uh, um, uh, to increase the stability, the delta frame and all those things. So this is a one thing which you are all the DNB students are doing uh, every day in their uh, uh, in their daily practice, and they should be able to. Uh, answer these questions. 
Now, this is, for example, <clears throat> is a Joshi external stabilization system, very commonly used, and um, uh, Dr. Joshi, especially, he has been using it for the uh, club foot, he has been using it for the hand, for correcting the contractures. Uh, excellent, uh, this thing, very cheap, very versatile, and people, can, they will ask you who was Joshi, the big push, and Joshi was the, uh, one of the uh, first orthopedic uh, surgeon with an Indian qualification in 1957 from the Bombay University, and he was a general orthopedic surgeon. Later on, he got interested into a hand, and he became an internationally renowned hand surgeon. Dr. Bridge Bhushan Joshi is no more with us, but he is known for his work, hand surgery work, and for his jest. We all remember that. Now, this is um, our uh, Elizero. Every hospital has been doing these days the Elizero technique, and they will ask you who was the uh, Elizero. Elizero was uh, worked in Krugen in Russia all his life. But he was not born in Russia, as far as I know, he was born in Poland, and then he moved to Russia, and in Krugen, he uh, uh, became the director of that uh, traumatology institute, and he got this idea from one uh, cycle repair chap who was sitting outside an Air Force workshop, and he found that the basic principle, you should know that it is a distraction of skill okay? So uh, they are basically the rings, then they are the rods, then they have got the wires, and these uh, wires could be 1.5 millimeter or 1.8 millimeter, uh, which are used, and there are olive wires, which have got a knob in between, which are used basically to pull a fragment into its normal direction. The tensioner is a, a very, very important uh, part of the Elisero technique, that they are normally asking that how much uh, should be the uh, tension when you are applying the uh, this thing. So usually it should be a, when you are using a 1.5 millimeter this thing, it is about 90 kg. But if you 1.8 millimeter, it goes much higher. So tensioner is very important. Unless you have tensioned this wire properly, the this system does not work. And then you can allow them to stand, walk, and it gives you an axial loading. It gives you the micro motion, and it simulates the flexor union. Very good for the infective non-union, for the limb lengthening procedure. So you should know uh, little basics of the Elizero. It's quite possible that the center where you are working may not be using an Elizero, but uh, the examiner will expect you to know the basic principle of Elizero technique and about the Elizero himself. Now here is a patient, then we come to the different type of uh, examiner is taking you to the ward and he says, what it is? You should be able to tell that this is a negative section surgical drain. And uh, then you will ask you what is the capacity that uh, when should you remove it? And um, uh, what are the problems that can come? And usually you see the all surgical drain must come out after 24 hours. Unless and until you have a special reason that you are still having a drain, then you can leave it for another 48 hours, but certainly not more than uh, beyond 48 hours. Sometimes they can ask you that uh, you find it that you are unable to take out a tube, then what is the reason? You should say that get entangled into the stitches, so we have to remove the stitches and take it out. That's a, a very, very important thing. And uh, most important thing they can ask you, what are the contraindications of uh, not putting a, a drain? So very important thing, is especially where you've done the uh, bone grafting, or you have put in, uh, put in some medicine there, your dopamadrol or something, and you do not want to drain it out. You have put in a well, the antibiotic uh, beads there that you do not want to put this uh, a drain. So this is a a very common thing, and you should be able to answer this uh, very carefully. And this is another example. You can see that where the negative section tube has also been put. And the lower down, what you see is a red color catheter. And this is a patient who had a flexure shaft of the femur, got infective, and he was pouring pus. 
So then this Malikot Pekatra was put inside. He was, uh, knee was left open. He was allowed to encourage, uh, to keep doing exercises. And with that, the Malikot catheter was put to the negative section, they say, and uh, the, gradually the whole pus was being drained and it helped us to get the union. So these are the few things that anything which will be in the board, you have been using it, the corrugated rubber drain, which work with the idea of an capillary drainage system. And uh, they can be of the latex uh, or that of a silicon. And uh, this is a uh, where I found the our DNB student fumble very much is about the dressing trolley. So the how many dressing trolley should be in a ward? Of course, a very simple answer. The two dressing trolley should be there, and uh, one for the infective cases, one for the non-infective cases. What all items should be there on the dressing trolley? So you should know what are the Usual dressing material should be on there. You should have an autoclave uh, uh, drum with all the dressing material. You should have a cap, mask, glove, stitch cutting thing. So all these things. And sometimes here the VAWA uh, comes on the post-op infection. So they will ask you what is the post-op infection rate of your ward, of uh, your unit, and what is the international standards you should be able to tell. The international, international standards are, if it is less than 1%, but 2 to 3% is the mostly the hospitals have got this thing. Now, most of the DNB students have no idea about the surgical site infection and uh, uh, pre-op uh, prophylactic use of antibiotic. And one should know about the abuse of antibiotic that lots of patients and surgeons are still using antibiotics for four days, five days, 10 days, which is absolutely contraindicated, should never be used because the use of so much of antibiotic suppresses the, the immune system of the body. So you should be uh, on this, I will say that little bit go and read about the surgical site infection very carefully, and you should be able to answer these questions. Now, the <clears throat> suction, um, sometimes in the ward is there because the only person who gets serious, you have to do the suction. Examiner can ask you about question on the suction machine. Yeah, this is a very uh, common thing seen that patient will got a paraplegic or something and he has been put in a police catheter. So there's a lot of viva I've seen examiners on the police catheter, the method, how do you put a police catheter, what is the capacity of the saline that you're going to put it, what is the capacity of this euro bag, which is usually two liters. And uh, the question which is uh, uh, asked mostly how long you can leave this police catheter. And the very important question which is asked that if you are trying to remove a police catheter and it is not coming out, then what will you do? Well, the, these days every hospital have gotten an ultrasound. You can do an ultrasound guided uh, puncture of the balloon and thereby you can remove it. And very rarely when it is still not coming up, then of course you have to go through a suprapubic area and remove this thing. So remember everything about the bigger. And you see, the, uh, that's what I always tell my DNB student that try to do all these procedures yourself. Unless until you pass the police catheter yourself, you will never be able to answer the question um, uh, with confidence. So how to insert a catheter, what precautions you could change, what are the indications, these things. And uh, to our surprise that uh, most of the students have never seen a Malikos catheter. Uh, uh, so the one you are seeing with a little flower at the bottom is a Malikos catheter. And very commonly it is used for as in a, as in a, when there is a pneumothorax or something, then you immediately as an emergency in the second intercostal space, you pot it and put it with the water seal. And that the one on the top you're seeing is a rubber catheter. Uh, for Mostly we use it for the, our paraplegic, where we teach them the intermittent uh, rubber catheterization. So that is a very, very important thing. And you must not say, sir, I have never seen. A very common thing, sir, I have never seen a Malikots catheter. I have never used any intermittent. We only use the Police catheter, yes, it's all right. But uh, as a surgeon, you should be knowing this thing. And uh, usually in the patient uh, have got paraplegic, you have the air, different type of air mattresses. 
and other different types of matrices. So you should be able to tell what are the advantage of air matrices, how you can prevent the bad sort, uh, like this patient, that uh, then how do you classify bad sores, how do you treat the bad sort, what is the, how to do a prevention of the bad sort, what is the log rolling, all these questions are asked. So you should know everything about the bad sort. That's a uh, very important and especially the type of the matrix and care of the back, which is very, very important that uh, the examiners are very fond of asking. The, uh, sometimes you find uh, if you have a ICU bed or something, the, the, uh, and, and surprisingly, when you ask a student, uh, what is the definition of the polytrauma? And uh, invariably, we have found the students are not able to cleanly define what is a polytrauma. Polytrauma is where you have more than um, uh, more than two systems getting involved, say a musculoskeletal system as well as a neural system or cardiac system or the respiratory system. Then it becomes a polytrauma. This is, of course, a patient who has got an immunomotorex that the chest tube has been put, you should be able to answer it. And then they ask you where you put this chest tube. Normally it is put in fourth or uh, fifth uh, intercostal space and, um, and um, put it with the uh, water seal. And this is a, a quite a common scene and uh, uh, damage control and all those things, the, the questions are asked. You find that the patient who has uh, undergone some uh, say chest surgery, like you might have done an anterior debima and the fixation of a spine, you find that this is lying by the side of the patient. The examiner asks you what it is. Well, it is basically a spirometer and where the patient are asked to flow through this thing to, uh, it is called a tri-flow, uh, tri and this is by you are trying to increase your vital capacity and you are trying to open up your alveoli and you're trying to prevent the ataractasis of the lungs. So this is a, uh, I've seen students saying, so I've never seen this thing. So, uh, well, the answer is that it is a type of spirometer for the physiotherapy of the lung. Now, even the, in one of the ward round, the, my co-examiner was asking the needles. So I, this was not included in my ward round. I added it yesterday that you should be able to tell uh, by the color of uh, the, these needles, that uh, uh, that this is how many gauge needles. So uh, these are the some things which uh, examiner are found that this is a basically a needle destroyer, electrical needle destroyer. You uh, put the needle and it gets heated up and it gets crushed because these are usually kept in every ward these days. It is a mandatory on the part of the pollution control board. So you cannot say that uh, I have never seen these things. And uh, another very important thing is these days is uh, the, uh, everywhere you have these types of uh, different buckets. And this is for the biomedical based bit. And uh, the, the I have seen and my co-examiners have seen the students have hardly any idea about the how a biomedical waste is uh, disposed of. So you have uh, the red bags, the blue bags, the yellow bags, and the black bags, and uh, uh, every bag has got its own. And this thing, like in red bag, you put mostly the plastic weights and uh, the old catheter, etc., or any injection or syringes, tubing, etc. And blue bag is mostly the glass bottles and articles which are outdated and discarded medicine. Yellow bag is mainly for the infectious waste and uh, the black bag is for the needles and the sharp instruments like blades, etc. So a little bit uh, uh, idea one should uh, have it. And so that when they ask you, you say, yes, we are following this thing. Sometimes they find uh, on the sister this thing, the culture swap tubes are there. They know how do you take a culture, how do you send this thing. And these are all very common things that you will see this thing. Now I would uh, uh, tell one thing to my dear student, that those who want to know a little bit more in detail about traction and autopilot, this is a very good book by Stewart and uh, Hallett, 
and uh, this is mainly uh, gives a lot of information about the traction. But uh, I would say that uh, the real good book is uh, written by my student, Upen Kumar, for whom I wrote a foreword. And this is a book that you should be reading uh, for your wardrobe, which I was when I told Upen to write this book because he attended uh, mine and John courses and he was very much uh, encouraged to write this thing. And this will answer your all the questions. Okay, so with these um, uh, thing, I think I am getting near to my time. And uh, so we cannot answer your every question. The idea of this ward round my lecture was to sensitize and to tell you that you are capable of securing up to 30, 35 marks. The maximum marks I have given is around 28, 29, but I want a student whom I would be able to give about 30, 35 marks, then it's going to pass. So thank you, John, for your uh, uh, this day. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, sir. Uh, I think there will be some questions from the delegates. So Janki, can you moderate that? Yes, sir. So if uh, participants have some question, DNBs? Sir, uh, good evening. Can you tell us something about uh, the indication? Sir, am I audible? Yeah. Yes, you are audible. Yes. yes, sir. Sir, good evening. Can you tell us uh, something about the indications of long and short cock-up splint and the second is cleaner and durant traction protocol? Sorry, long and short? Cock-up splint and the second question. Yes, sir. And the second is cleaner and durant traction protocol. Sorry, I have not understood. What is your question? Sir, the first question is short and long pop-up split. And the second question is the cleaner and durant protocol. Cleaner and durant traction protocol. You, you want to know long and short uh, plaster? Yes, sir. Cock-up splints. Cock-up splints, yes. Cock up is plant. Okay. Cock up is basically the cock up is for the hidden nerve paralysis. And uh, we have not covered your orthotic and uh, orthotic and prosthetics here. Yeah. And uh, uh, all patients who have got a wrist drop, you have to give them a cock up is plant. And so that you see that if you uh, Leave it here up to the metacarpo, flangeal joint, and then the uh, the wrist extensor will be supported. And at the same time, you can allow the uh, the the extensors of the fingers to be exercised. That is a very important. Okay. So that is where the cock up sprints are used. The, what was your other question? What was your other question? Sir, my other question was the rubber bands that we use up in cock-up splint. Uh, there are two types of protocols, the cleaner traction protocol and the durant traction protocol. Sir, for the rubber bands that we use up in those splints. I don't know what you're talking about. John, can you understand what he's talking about? I think these are basically uh, protocols used for these. Uh, with the uh, cock-up splint, you have this dynamic... Yeah splints with the rubber bands. Yeah. So I think that's what he's asking about. No, all, all I know that sometimes, you know, in the, uh, in the cock of splint, you can have a little small ring along with that you apply a rubber band. So idea is that with this rubber band, you can rubber band help you and assist you in getting an extension. And then you can have the, because flexion is not a problem. But the extension is problem. The rubber band helps you to assist in getting the extension. And they help you to gain the power. Yeah. What was the other question, boy? Sir, that is it, sir. Okay, right. Any other question, Vitae? So, Vinas. Sir, uh, about uh, this here paper, sir, uh, there are a few questions which was asked which uh, usually we read in uh, for the ward rounds, like you saw, they have asked, FRO they have asked in the theory, one special type of staple they have asked, uh, and uh, then laminar airflow, and uh, 
like few things like mipo also they have so for the theory also i think word round is also very important for to answer these questions because otherwise we are not able to read these you saw and all is only mm. views uh, uh, uh janki the yes, yes. problem is that uh, these days lots of other uh, dressing materials commercial dressing materials have come silver sulfur and other things and all. so they boys have never seen what the use all is use all is basically it was an edinburgh university uh, solution of lime which uh, they had a boric acid and the uh, bleaching powder and they used to mix it and that uh, when it was applied to a um, very dirty wound it will get, give a nascent uh, chlorine and it will be able to clear the and slough out uh, this thing and uh, we as a house surgeon when we were there and john we all have used use all solution uh, uh, very much so uh, student that's what i was telling you that uh, if you read this book of open we have given you the all the list of the different solution which should be on your dressing uh, trolley the another thing which i want to tell you to the student that if they go and pick up any book of materia medica then in the last of that materia medica book there is a one chapter on the dressing material and the dress, uh, uh, dressing uh, uh, medicines which has to be used at different things at different places they can use it you know these days nobody use copper sulfate silver all those things have been used from time uh, onward and what else was done ki Sir, uh, one more thing. What was, was asked in the theory? Yeah. Laminar uh, airflow. Laminar airflow. Yes. Laminar airflow is basically is not a part of the ward round. It is a part of the operation theatre technique, uh, where you get the uh, the bacteria uh, free air under pressure uh, through the HEPA filters, and which comes down, uh, and then it is sucked here. and it goes back and is refiltered and it comes there now you see the um, uh, um a lot of thing has been talked about ki whether the laminar air flow is a uh, important in reducing the infection rate or not and there are some uh, comparative study and they say that if you have a good uh, operation theater sterility and good operation theater uh, discipline and you have used the prophylactic antibiotic their results and post operative infection rate where there is a laminar flow uh, the in fact there were not much difference on the infection rate this is an icmr study i will just tell you janki that when i was working in london uh, in a, one of the top hospitals in um, institute of orthopedics in london my none of my that none of my at that time the hospital had a laminar flow and we were doing all uh, joint replacement and we were doing all the scoliosis surgery and this thing. so Uh, so this is a uh, full thing on the operation theater technique where they want to talk to you about what is should be the temperature of the operation theater when you are working it which should be ideal should be around 21 to 22 degree use of the ultraviolet rays for the sterilization of this thing how do you do the fumigation of the operation theater what are the method of sterilization the chemical method the steam uh, this thing the gamma radiation and Uh, the ETO, etc. All these questions, or uh, um, this thing, they can ask in the theory, but they are, these things are not in the ward because ward is what they see there, and the examiner will ask you. Okay? Yes, Janki. Like one other question, they have asked if R O S R, flow reaction, not. That's an orthosis, no? If R O which is. Uh, basically, it is in a part of the orthosis, flow reaction orthosis. the flow reaction orthosis is basically the whole idea came from israel and uh, when dr pk sethi read that article and he said that we should start doing this i attended the first uh, workshop which sethi conducted in jaipur here basically it is for the paralysis of the quadriceps muscle so what you do you have the foot in slight degree of 15 degrees of equinal and when uh, the child is walking on this the position the force is created from the flow and that's how called the flow reaction orthosis and then it when the flow goes it presses the upper part of the orthosis presses over the knee joint and that causes the locking of the knee joint 
and stabilize the knee joint and you are able to do the propulsion like this is what you are doing it when you are walking it and you are putting your hand just above the uh, knee joint for uh, locking it in cases of the cordyceps paralysis so this flow reaction orthosis is a very common question in uh, uh, orthotic prosthetic table everybody we ask you and okay if it has been asked in the story the boy should be able to answer that so uh, for daily ward round and uh, in dnb curriculum they are put it as one grand ward round every week so mm -hmm. what is the primary aim for that one sir the <clears throat> i tell you what is a grand round you see the basic idea of the grand round is that you see uh, if the, you have a lots of uh, john has got lots of patients about 100 patients lying in your hospital that the once in a week the whole team within the leader of the team along with your post graduate should go to each and every bed and take the round in detail not only about the patient whether the boys have written take the case history whether they have written it properly or not whether uh, they have examined the patient or not the the chief or the other consultant can have a random examine the patient they can say that you have not written the finding then the drug uh, whether the patient is getting proper drug uh, which has been prescribed to him whether he is getting proper nursing or not so this thing also uh, is a uh, part of the grand round and the usually when i was in the medical college where i used to have about 80 90 100 patients on my orthopedic my grand round used to be on such a day i used to start about 8 o'clock and we used to go about 12 o'clock and up to 1 o'clock the grand round would go because they it will combine a very thorough uh, this thing whether the beds are properly being made whether proper nursing is going or not proper cleanliness of the ward is going or not when was the sterility swab was then what is the infection rate going on so you see everything related to the patient care and uh, the ward uh, maintenance is done on the day of the grand round otherwise you see every day the surgeon and the team is so very busy either they are in opd or they are in the operation theater and they have no so much time so once in a week uh, they say that you must have a grand round we used to have it in london also my boss used to have it on tuesday from uh, 8 o'clock till 1:30 we'll go on see each and every day So I think uh, any questions from the DNB students again? I mean, I think yeah. they've had just a couple, but I'm sure they may have other. Sir, uh, sir, I want to ask: What questions can we put on uh, uh, back dressing? In yeah. Art? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> back dressing is a basically a vacuum uh, uh, dressing where you have an open wound, so you create a. a dressing which is a totally air sealed and then you have a uh, connected to a machine uh, where you have a low uh, uh, low pressure and thereby the everything which is slough and everything is coming out will be sucked in and then it it, it stimulates the angiogenesis it stimulates the new granulation tissue formation and uh, the healing of such wound becomes very fast it is a uh, now uh, lots of people have commercially also making this uh, uh, wax system which is uh, quite costly also some people have uh, device their own machine kulkarni has done its own machine and some so the even the wax uh, is sometimes there is on the patient they examine it and ask you yeah so i think the uh, uh, you can talk about wax in two ways one is the open wound wax dressings yeah. today you also have incisional wac okay so where you have say like in a post calcaneal fracture or a pilon fracture uh, the swelling and when you close the wound uh, you're worried about further swelling causing tension in the wound so people would put a wac dressing over that and that is called incisional wac the normal wac is used for open, open. wound but remember two things uh, wac is not a treatment for infection okay it's a treatment to promote granulation tissue reduce the fluid accumulation around the wound uh, but your debridement is what will 
get rid of the infection, okay? So this is a temporization uh, method where you delay your eventual closure or your flap cover of an open wound, okay? So be clear that this doesn't deal with your infection. Don't expect it to get rid of dead tissue or necrotic tissue. That has to be done surgically. What this will help you with is, uh, one is to keep the wound covered adequately so that you don't get desiccation of the wound. If you leave open wounds with packing, that's what is to happen. Uh, it also will prevent uh, fluid accumulation, which will then promote infection. And it will, because of the gauze there with the intermittent suction, it's supposed to uh, improve the oxygenation of tissue as well as therefore improve the formation of granulation tissue. Okay. That one more thing, uh, pressure they used to us. How much pressure it should be for the wear? I think people should know that. I don't think yeah. we need to answer yes. that here. But it's usually a, a less than 120 millimeters of mercury. So it's between 80 to 120 millimeters that you would use. But I think this is something which all of everyone should be aware of. I don't think we need to answer this here. Not a not a very strong pressure, yeah. Not a very strong pressure. Yeah. It's a low pressure. Thing. Okay. Uh, Any other questions? questions? Otherwise, we should allow Dr. Taneja some rest. <laughs> He's <laughs> pretty hard on this. Uh, I think it's yes. important for a lot of these things. Again, but there are one of the two things. So something like Usol solution today, very few places use it. And I really oh. don't think it's a relevant question in today's day of wound management. I think most hardly, places stopped uh, using it. I don't know why they ask. You, you hardly see on any dressing trolley you saw being kept. You see the problem is the John, the examiners who come, they come of <laughs> the elderly and senior who have used in their time. So they no, no, so even I've used it and we still sometimes use it, I have to admit. But it's yeah. not something which in today's practice say anywhere they're using a lot of, especially with the inception of bag dressings etc very few people actually use you saw anymore so and uh, there's enough uh, now literature showing that it's probably not a good thing to use but I don't know the relevance of asking questions like that in today's day and age but anyway that's a different question already Okay, so, uh, I think uh, sir, we should call just, it a day now. Yeah. Okay. Just one thing, sir. Yes, Janke. For that one, sir. So it is the same pattern, but uh, I think there is no problem for that one. What, we, we missed what you said. Sir, you know, that, internet obje was, OSCE, that objective OSCE. structures, yeah, OSCE. OSCE, OSCE, now the orals and vivas are probably going to be OSCE because of the, it's been, it was always a plan, but now with the COVID epidemic, it has been accelerated. So the last exam, I believe the orals were conducted uh, with OSCE rather than real patients, etc. Yeah, now they are going mostly on to the OSCE and uh, because the hospitals don't have patients. All patients mostly are COVID, and uh, therefore they recently we had examination in indoor. We had it on a lot of things on OSCE. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a new thing which they'll have to get used to. Yeah, they'll have to practice it before the exam. Yes, you'll have to. So you'll have patients. Will you have clinical findings written down, and then you'll get asked questions on that rather than the yes. Uh, ex uh, student actually examining the patient and finding out the clinical findings. So, also, you Thank can you so have much. some uh, sort of situations which are uh, not real, but in fact, uh, uh, situation. Uh, John, the OSCE has been going on. Uh, for many years, especially in, well, in some uh, other specialties, yeah. Anesthesia. Orthopedic exactly. did not introduce OSCE because uh, uh, some of us, we said, no, very important is that uh, 
we have to have a clinical examination of our I know. So therefore, we OSCE did not was not introduced into orthopedics. I I I even attended a workshop on OSCE when the national board organized that. Yeah. Uh, but now it is becoming a, almost a compulsive. So there is no way out. You can do that. Yeah. Sure. Okay. I think. Uh, so thank you very much, Dr. Taneja. Uh, I think that was excellent and. Uh, and thanks to our uh, Ortho TV, Ortho TV chap. Is, yeah. The very sure. <laughs> I must congratulate him. He has made Ortho TV very popular. <laughs> very nice. Thank you, John. Okay, yes. great. Thank you. So Thank you so it. much, sir. Thank you, sir. Bye bye, John. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Leave.